If you would take your Bibles with me this morning, we're going to start in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 11 and going to verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 11 and going to verse 12. It says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. You know, the Scripture starts off here in verse 11 with maybe a word that a lot of us aren't familiar with. It's a word you don't hear much anymore. Sojourners. Boy, that's an odd word, isn't it? Basically, it means this is not my home. I am simply passing through. That This is not a permanent dwelling. This is temporary. I'm working towards my eternal home. And the Bible tells me in this passage, it tells me that as sojourners, as a pilgrim, that there are certain things I need to abstain from. There are certain things I need to stay away from. Why? Why is that so important? Why does God care about what I do or what I don't do? Well, you know, when you think about it in that context, it may seem a little aloof. But let me bring it down just a little bit, okay? I love my kids. But sometimes the things they do, I do not love so much. I'll see them go outside and play and they'll have a wonderful time and they'll get covered in dirt and grime and all this junk. And I'll tell them, say, kids, don't do that. That's yucky. It is nasty. You don't need to do it. But dad, we're having fun. That's what you hear all the time, isn't it? But dad, we're having fun. Why do I care? They're outside. Fine. Go play. Go. Have fun. Go, go tear it up. But then there comes a point at some point that they want to come into my house. And if they bring all that into my house, I know what's going to happen. They're going to ruin my couch. They're going to ruin my chair. The carpet's going to have all kind of tracks all over it. They're going to completely demolish my home. Now God tells me, He says, if you care about your house so much, how do you think I feel about my house? And He says, before you come into my house, here's what I'm going to tell you. Abstain from the things that will taint my home. Abstain from the things that will ruin what I have for you in life. And He tells you, as sojourners, as pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which what? War against the soul. I was told a long time ago that there are two dogs in life. One dog, if you feed it and take care of it, it will grow and become strong and a mighty animal. But if you starve the other one, it will eventually die. That's a very good parallel between the soul and the flesh. Whichever one you feed, that's the one that's going to be strong. This passage not only tells me that God is bringing me to an eternal home and I need to prepare for it, He tells me that whatever I choose to feed in this life will war against the other one. He said if you choose to, to uh, feed the lust of the flesh, the things that war against the commandments of God, that desire to rebel against God will get stronger. The things that harm you will get stronger. And the call of God will seem like a faint call. It will just go out farther and farther and farther away until you don't even hear it anymore. And you got so many people out there telling you right now, they say, if God loves you, if God loves you, He would never let you get away from Him. You know, that's false logic. That's false logic right there. Because God loves you so much, God never moves. That's how much God loves you. He's a fixed point. And He loves you so much that He allows you to go wherever you desire. But He warns you what's going to happen. He says, you get away from Me, here's what's going to happen. That's exactly why He warns us in Scripture. That's exactly why He warns us about the lust of the flesh and the things against God because it pulls us away from Him into areas that will do us harm and hurt us if we're not careful. Things that will prevent us from having an eternal home with God. If you look at verse 12, it tells us having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. 
that when they may speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. A couple things to walk away with there. One, it's telling me that if I live godly, if I live in such a way that I'm honoring God by how I live, it'll be a testimony to those who even do not believe in God. It will be a testament to them to say God is real, that God is active in my life. It will be a testimony to them. And look at the last part of this verse, because this is important. It says that there will be. It doesn't say if, it says when. Day of visitation. It means that there will come a day when all of us face God. Every single solitary one of us will face God. Boy, that's kind of a scary thought when you think about it, isn't it? I mean, talking about God here is just fine, but the day I got to meet Him, stand nose to nose with Him, face to face, that's a little intimidating. But this is where God tells us exactly what we need to do to prepare for that day. If you take your Bibles and you just look over to the, next, to, to the, the book prior, to 1 Peter into James chapter 1 James chapter 1 and verse 21 he tells us again he says therefore laying aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive the word with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself for if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. He observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Now we read that and you think, well boy, that's kind of confusing. Well, think about it in this context because it's actually pretty straightforward. When we were young, we were told, treat others how you want to be treated. Were we all pretty much told that as a kid? Golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated, right? We were told that kind of harder to put into practice than you realize, isn't it? I'll tell my kids, I tell them the same thing I was told when I was a young man. Say, kids, you want to treat others how you want to be treated. Make sure you do that. Yes, Dad, we know that. We know that. You would never guess it by watching them during the week. They get in the fights. They get mad with each other. They yell at each other. And I'll get on them. I'll go over to him and say, now guys, are you actually doing what I told you to do? What? Treat others how you want to be treated. Is that what you're doing? Yes. I was like, well, how so? How do you say this is how you want to be treated? They were wrong. They were wrong. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I missed that part. So let's play again. Let's try it another way. I say, you be the person that did the wrong, and I'll be you. I'll say only what you said, okay? All right. So we reenact it. And I'm as hard on them as they were to each other. I said, how'd that feel? I didn't like it. I said, that's what it means by treating others how you want to be treated. You did not hear yourself. The Bible states here, that there's a, a challenge for each of us where we want to hear the Word of God. We don't want to practice the Word of God. And it's the same thing as what I just demonstrated with my kids. I hear the Word of God, but I'm not putting it into practice. And God says when you do that, you're like a man observing himself in the mirror. You can see perfectly everything in front of you, but the moment you walk away, you forget what you are looking at. And that's the challenge for the believer. Church, we can't, be a, we can't be a people of God only hearing the Word and not putting it into practice. It makes us ineffectual. And not only that, but it destroys the witness that we're trying to give to others about Jesus Christ. Remember what we read earlier. That simply by our good works, by people seeing that we are trying to live out what, what we believe, that they will see God and glorify Him by our actions. They'll see God and glorify Him by that measure. And that's an amazing feat right there. That's a divine feat by God Himself. As a Christian, we have to be putting the Word of God into practice every single day. Now the world doesn't understand it because the world does exactly what Satan does. They take it out of context. They'll tell you, don't judge me. The Bible says, do not judge me. Hogwash. That's out of biblical context. The entirety of that verse is lest you be judged by the same measure in which you judge somebody else. It's telling me be careful. 
God will add that, that measure back to you. You better hold up to your own judgment. They take it out of context. Pastor, you have to love everybody. There is a, a d- important distinction between loving somebody and giving approval for what they're doing. There's a very big distinction there. Church, we have to understand what it means to be a Christian and then put that in the practice. Not to be a hearer of God's Word only, but to be a doer. That's why I'm excited over today. We have a baptism later today. Two of them. And I'm thrilled over it. Because we got two young people coming up here saying, I'm not only going to be a hearer of God's Word, I'm going to practice it. I'm going to put it into practice and I want everybody to know that I'm going to live according to God's Holy Word. Will they fail? Absolutely. Are they going to get up? Absolutely. Because they're living for Jesus Christ. I'm excited to see them take that step forward. And for us today, we need to do the same. As a matter of fact, when you go on to verse 26, it tells us, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, This one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That means that I need to be walking a a very close walk with Jesus Christ. Not being passive in what I do for Christ. Church, when we see this Scripture, it's telling us, it says, listen, if you're just giving lip service, if you're just, if you're just saying one thing but you're doing another, your religion is useless. I remember years ago when I worked out, worked out in the world, I earned a nickname. I earned a nickname out in the world. They called me Preacher Boy. I was always sharing with somebody, Jesus, they called me Preacher Boy. That was my nickname for years. And I remember during that time, people would challenge me in the Word. They would do things to try to make me mad and then to step back and watch and see what I would do. Boy, that's hard. you got to die to the flesh in that moment. You can't live for it anymore. The world's wanting to see, are you genuine? Are you real? They're just going to poke at you. They're just going to stand there and poke, 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 poke. My kids do the same thing. We're on the way to church. We're going to be holy today. We're going to go to church. And there's my kids in the back. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. Mom, he's not touching me. I thought that was the idea. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. Kids, be still. We're going to church. We're going to worship God. Doggone it. And we all go to church and happy clappy and we're having a great time. Every parent understands that scenario. It's hard serving God when everything seems to be coming apart at the seams. It's hard to do the right thing when you got the world sitting there saying, I'm not touching you. It's hard. But God says you're going to reap a reward if you keep yourself unspotted from the world. If you're confessing your sins before God Almighty. If you're getting right before Him as you walk for Him daily, struggling, but yet making the effort to do the right thing. God says, I will honor you. I will bless you. I will make you a testimony to those around you. My name will be glorified by you. He says, this is what's coming for the one who works and endeavors for Me. Recognize that this world is not your permanent home. Say, Pastor, what do you mean it's not my permanent home? I'm meaning each and every one of us has an expiration date. And when you get to that date, you enter into eternity. It's time to start asking the question where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? When we look at this further in Scripture, in Acts chapter 8, we're introduced to a man. The Ethiopian eunuch. Some of you know this story. Some of you may not. It's a powerful story. This man here. Well, I'm just going to read a little bit and then I'll explain what's going on here. Verse, first two verses, 26 and 27 of Acts chapter 8. It says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. And so he arose and went. 
And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. I want to pause here for a moment. There's something you might overlook here. It's easy to overlook. This man's from Ethiopia. He serves his queen. He traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to solely worship God. That's impressive. I get up and drive 15 minutes to church with a bunch of kids. I think I've accomplished something. This man went from Ethiopia to Jerusalem according to Scripture, to worship God. And he tells Philip, who is, a, who is a deacon of the church at this time, he is a disciple of Christ, he tells him, he says, I want you to do ministry. I want you to go and witness. But here's what I want you to do. Go out in the desert. Huh? I mean, if I were Philip, I would be confused at this point. I'd be saying, now God, wait a minute. You want me to do ministry, I should be going to Jerusalem. I should be going to Antioch. I should be going to one of these places, Ephesus. I should be going to one of these places where there are people. God, maybe you don't know this, but Gaza is empty. There's desert there. Sometimes we feel that way. God tells us something, it makes absolutely no sense. And we're kind of in that fill-up mode where we're saying, this makes no sense to me. None whatsoever. Why would you send me there? But God says to Philip, I want you to go. I want you to go over there right now. I've got something I want you to do. Part of being a Christian, I say this to the folks getting baptized, I say it to any new believers in the room, part of being a Christian is obeying God even when it does not make sense to you. And that's an important step you have to take as a Christian, is to obey God sometimes even when it makes no sense. Here Philip goes out into the desert, and we have this Ethiopian, this eunuch, and he's leaving Jerusalem. He's already worshipped. He's leaving now. And it says in verse 28, he was returning and sitting in his chariot and reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him, Uh, read and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and sit with him. Here Philip was in the desert and he happened to come across this eunuch. This eunuch's been the church. He heard the Gospel. He's a man of faith. And here he is reading the book of Isaiah and he has a moment similar to what you and I may have every day when we're trying to read our Bible. Philip looks at him and he says, do you understand? He says, how can I? Modern vernacular, this makes no sense to me whatsoever. I go to church because I believe in God. I go to church because I've been told all my life it is the right thing to do. And here I am reading the scrolls of Isaiah and it makes no sense to me. I'm trying to be obedient. But it makes no sense. And then he tells Philip, he says, I want you to come up here. I want you to come up here. He tells him right here in verse 31, he says, and he asked him, being Philip, to come and sit with him. He didn't push him away. He said, I want you to come here and sit with me and go through this. The Scripture he was reading in verse 32, he says, in the place in Scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before a shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. His humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this Scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Woo! He preached Jesus to the eunuch at this point. The door was open. And he said, let me go. Man, that's a Christian for you right there. He says, Lord, I am pumped. I've been waiting for this day. I've been reading Your Word. I've been praying. I've been been waiting for You just to open the door. And Lord, here You brought me into the desert 
to this eunuch, to this man who loves you. He's searching for you. And now he asked me to tell him about you. Buddy, you better get a seat. I'm fired up now. I'm going to tell you about my Jesus. He tells him, he says, "What, what does the prophet mean by this? I can only imagine what Philip said. I want to tell you there was a man named Jesus that came to the world. He was my best friend. And he was my Savior. And he sacrificed his life for you and me. He was led to the cross and He died so that you could be forgiven of sin. So that I could be forgiven of sin. He was the Lamb for the people of Jerusalem. He was the Lamb for the Gentiles of the world. He was the Lamb that covered our sins. And brother, you're reading about Him. The Son of God. And He loves you. And man, what a powerful testimony that He was fired up and He was ready to share what Jesus meant not only to Him, but what Jesus meant to this eunuch as well. And see, that's what it means to you and I. It's not just a word removed. It's not just something for the scholarly to dig in and try to find some deep hidden truth. The truth is there for even a child to find. God loves you. He cares for you. He died for your sins. And the amazing thing about all of it is, you know it! Because you feel it in your heart. Whether you deny it or not, you feel it. And you know that He loves you. So many of us today, we get so bogged down with all the hatred and the anger that we felt in this life. And the idea that somebody could actually love me, no matter what I do, is a foreign concept to me. I mean, if you told me that He hated me because I'm a sinner, I would understand that. Because I know what hatred is. I've grown up my whole life seeing it. I understand that. If you told me He was angry with me, I would understand that. i felt that all my life. If you told me He rejected me, I would get that too because i felt that same thing. But now you're telling me that He loves me. You're telling me that He doesn't reject me. You're telling me He doesn't hate me. What do I do with that? See, oftentimes we never think about it in those, those terms, do we? The world understands hatred. It has no idea of love. Not even a clue. And here Philip, when he ran to that Ethiopian, says, let me tell you something about the one you're reading about. Could you and I do the same today? If that were us, if we were led to somebody looking for truth, would you be able to do that? To share with them what Jesus means and who He really is? Could you call out somebody who was, who was living in sin, but do it in such a way that they felt the love of God pulling them in? That they would leave that garbage behind? I told you earlier about my kids being dirty, wanting to come into the, into the house. And no, I don't let them in dirty. What I do, what my wife does, is exactly what God does for you and me. We meet them on the front step. We take off their shoes because they're covered in filth. We grab them. We bring them into the home carefully so as not to get dirt on anything. We get them into the shower. We clean them off. And when they're clean, they get dressed in clean clothes. And they have run of the house then. What God does for you and me is He meets us on the front step. He takes off our dirty shoes and He brings us into the house and and gets us clean. This Ethiopian is saying, Philip, I want to be clean. I've gone to Jerusalem to worship God Almighty and I still don't understand what I've read. And Philip says, let me show you what God thinks of you. Let me show you what He did for you. And let me show you how to go forward. And when all of it was done, after Philip did all these things, it states in verse 36, it says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, this is the eunuch. 
he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. That's incredible, isn't it? That's incredible. The love of God was shared in such a way that it changed someone's life forever. I'm going to tell you right now, you may have some things in your life you need to work out, but there's one thing I want you to leave with this morning. God loves you. I want you to leave with that. I want you to tuck that in your pocket and know that for certain. God loves you. But there's also a couple things you need to know. God will never make any excuses for you. And He's waiting for you to love Him. Those are two more things you need to walk away with. God never stopped loving you. He's waiting for you to return the love He has for you. It's a sad statement. But we all know what that's like, don't we? When I was dating my wife, there came a point in our relationship where I wanted to marry her. And there's, a, there's something a man has to do at this point that's terrifying for any man, but it's a necessary step. I went out and I bought a ring. And I had to ask her a question. So I got down on my knee. And I looked at my beautiful wife. And I, I told her, I said, sweetheart, I love you with all my life. Will you marry me? And at that moment, I had to wait for her to respond. I had to hear from her that she loved me too and wanted to accept my ring. In our lives, even now as this sermon is being preached, Christ is pursuing you. And He's looking at you and He's saying, I love you. And He's waiting for your response. Here the eunuch had been searching for God all this time and he, he didn't know. And here Philip comes and he says, I'm going to show you the way. His name is Jesus. I'm going to show you. And when the preaching was done, when everything was done, and they're out there in the desert, there came a point where the eunuch had to make a decision. Jesus was there. And that eunuch had to decide, do I love God or am I going to keep on running? And finally the eunuch stopped and he said, I want Jesus as my Lord. And he confessed Him and he was baptized. And the Scripture says to us believers today who accepted God, don't be hearers of the Word only, be doers of the Word. Take that Word and do something with it. Share with somebody the transformative power of Jesus Christ today. Let them feel the love of God surrounding them through the presence that God has in your life. Let your life be a testimony to what God can do with a mess. Because I'm telling you right now, everyone in this room, we're a mess. Until Jesus stepped in. One last scripture and we'll close. Music can go ahead and start making your way forward. And, and Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Here's the last scripture for the day. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a lampstand, it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. My wife teases me. She jokes with me all the time. She tells me I rarely give a sermon without giving a food analogy. That's true. Food speaks to me. Salt's a wonderful thing. It makes about anything taste better, doesn't it? Whenever we cook in the house, I call myself kind of the egg savant in our house. I'm, I'm in charge of cooking the eggs. And I'll get my egg mixture up and I'll, I'll stir it all up, start making scrambled eggs. 
and the eggs are good. Your protein's there. Everything's there for a good meal. It's not perfect yet. And I'll add some pepper in there, and it helps it, but still it's not, it's not quite right. I'll go get some salt. I'll put some salt in there. We're getting closer. We're getting a lot closer. But you know I'm kind of in the mood for an omelet. And I'll, I'll take some peppers and cut them up and some onions and some butter and I'll put it in the skillet and saute them first. Then I'll add my egg mixture in. And then as that egg mixture cooks and it's, it's pretty close to done, I'll take some cheese and I'll just put all over that. If I got some ham, maybe put some ham in there. And then I'll serve it up to my family. And they're all, boy, this is good. That's what I'm talking about. That's some good stuff. But you know, it's so funny. If I only gave them the eggs, it wouldn't taste good. If I only gave them the salt, it wouldn't work. Or only the pepper, or only the onion, or only the, the green pepper. It just, it wouldn't work. When you put it all together, amazing when you take this word and you understand what Christ did for you you're not just talking about one thing in scripture or two or three when you take all of it and you put it all together and you realize who Jesus is and what he can do there's nothing better see that's kind of where the unit came that day he traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship and it wasn't enough. He read from the book of Isaiah and he couldn't understand. But then there came a man who'd been with Jesus who heard his words, who knew his character and his love. And he came to the eunuch and he said, let me share with you what you're missing. You're missing Jesus. You're missing the Son of God. The greatest part of all of this, you're missing. And when it was all said and done, he said, where is some water that I can be baptized and follow Jesus with all my heart? I don't want to run anymore. I don't want anything else. And you know what's even more amazing is we know today now from writings, we know that this man took the gospel to Africa. And that's what started the Christian movement in Africa that day. It was the man that found Jesus in the middle of the desert and got baptized. And he took Jesus home. Took him home. Today, you may have come to church for any number of reasons. Curiosity. Looking for something different to see two young people commit their lives to Jesus and be baptized. Whatever brought you here today, you're here for a reason. And you're here for a purpose. And whether you know it or not, it's to give you a chance to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I've grown up in church all my life. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I grew up hating church. I grew up hating every minute of it. But when I met Jesus, everything changed. Jesus is what makes it what it's supposed to be. Jesus is the missing ingredient that we all need. And today, if you've never asked Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, if you're someone where you just don't know for sure where you stand with Him this morning, if you're someone that you just want a deeper walk with God, you may say, Pastor, I've tried so many things. I've tried so many different things and not one of them have worked. I want to ask you to try Jesus today. If you're someone right now where you just look at the things going on around you and you're scared to death and you're looking for answers, look to Jesus. I promise you, I give you my word as a man as a pastor, as a father, as a husband. I give you my word. If you truly commit your life and your heart to Jesus Christ, 
you'll never want anything else. Whatever needs you have today, whatever prayer you need to pray, whatever's on your heart, I invite you to this altar. For any need you have, this altar's open. Please come.